Greetings. This is Caroline Staten with Transition US. And thank you so much for joining us today for this teleseminar, The Power of Conflict for Building Connection and Community. And when I last checked a few hours ago, there were almost 400 people registered for this event. So this topic has obviously struck a chord. And our presenters and many others are of a mind that if we cannot work with conflict, then we probably cannot create a sustainable town or sustainable future. Conflict is one of the most essential sustainability skills and will serve us in every walk of life. When in conflict, do you want to fight, flee, or freeze? How do you respond? Most of, up were, most of us were brought up to either ignore conflict or go in swinging to win. And as we grew older, we learned ways to suppress it or avoid it. But what if conflict was a secret ally? What if it's a guidepost showing us what really matters and how much we care? Those of us working to build a more resilient world need to be able to work well with each other in our neighborhoods, nonprofits, transition initiatives, families, and workplaces. We need to build bridges and be able to communicate and break down the tensions that sometimes seem unbearable. So following um, that overview, I wanted to introduce our three practitioners. They come from the Fellowship for Intentional Community, Guy Education, and the Rocky Mountain Institute. So first off, we'll be hearing um, from the three presenters, and then we'll be um, listening to a little bit of a conversation that they'll hold together, and then we'll open it up for Q&A. And there will be some polling along the way too. You'll be asked some questions, again, pressing um, phone numbers on your keypad. So without further ado, here are our um, presenters today. Jacob Corvide is a manager at Rocky Mountain Institute with a focus on transforming the residential energy upgrade market through the Residential Energy Plus program and is launching the Fort Collins project. He's worked in sustainable community development with a focus on sustainability, innovation, program design, community-based solutions, and collaboration building. Previously, Jacob was with, uh, he was the executive director of EcoWorks, a nonprofit in Detroit, and co-founder and former president of the Southeast Michigan Regional Energy Office. Um, Jacob was also a pioneer in the EcoVillage movement and enjoys public speaking, is an adjunct professor at the University of Detroit Mercy School of Architecture, and does work in facilitation and conflict resolution. So that's Jacob. And Maya Quay Ludwig is the executive director of the Center for Sustainable and Cooperative Culture at Dancing Rabbit Eco Village and the Sustainable Communities Director for Commu Commonomics. USA's Materialized Empathy Project. She's done sustainability education work and combines that experience with over two decades of intentional community living to create a holistic, practical education experience. Maya Quay also teaches cooperative group dynamics, including facilitation, leadership, and consensus, and is a climate change activist. She published a book called Passion as Big as the Planet, which looks at the intersection between spiritual development and effective ecological activism. She is currently working on starting a new community in Laramie, Wyoming with her partner. And Allison Ewald has spent over 20 years leading environmental and educational programs, both, with, both within the U.S. and abroad. Allison serves as facilitator of the social dimension of Gaia Education's online course in sustainable design. She's a teacher of a cooperative homeschool, a consultant and trainer for communities working to build their facilitation, decision-making, and conflict engagement skills. She's an avid student 
of conflict and restorative circles and has lived overseas for nine years in Russia, Ukraine, Hungary, and Croatia. She's coordinated professional and student exchanges, taught language, leadership, and nonviolence programs. She's an advisor with the Altai Project, a nonprofit supporting Siberian indigenous environmental groups. She's also served as a board member for Dancing Rabbit and the Fellowship for Intentional Communities. Uh, recently, she's co-founded Red Earth Farms, a homesteading community in Missouri where she lives with her partner and young daughter. So that's who's with us today. I wanted to mention, before I turn it over to you, Jacob, um, both heartfelt thanks for you three joining us. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, really excited to be here, everybody. Thanks so much for the, the great response and for everyone joining us here. Um, looking forward to the conversation and uh, appreciate not only uh, the Carolyn making this space, but also it's an honor, of course, to, to do this work with Allison and Mike Way. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, start through with our slides here a little bit. What I'm going to do is really try to set the stage with some basic concepts of how we should be thinking about and understanding conflict in our lives before handing it on to Allison and Mike, who are going to talk uh, in a little more depth about um, specific approaches. So I, I will, my, my, my talk will suggest some approach, approaches, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit, but I'm mostly going to try to lay the foundation and groundwork. So I want to start by finding out more information about you all, though, because this is a lot of us talking at you. So I wanted to find out, uh, start with our first poll. And uh, the thing I wanted to first try to find out is what level of experience do you have in conflict resolution or conflict transformation work? Um, and the way this is going to work is you can go to your dial pad, um, press a 1 for none, no experience, uh, 2 for a little, 3 for some, 4 for a lot, or 5 uh, for I'm a deep practitioner of this art. Uh, so one is none, five is your, your way in deep on this uh, conflict work. And if you want to go ahead and send, press the button on your phone, send in those poll amounts, and then um, Carolyn, I'm assuming you will give us what the results are on that poll. Is that right? I, I will be, yes. Um, so again, here's your opportunity to chime in and let us know. Uh, looks like it's stopping now. So 13%. Um, pressed 1 on their keypad, Jacob. 16 mm -hmm. pressed 2. Um, 40, or tw excuse me, 27% pressed 3. 13 pressed 21. And 1%, I mean 13 pressed 4. And 1% pressed 5. Great. That's great. So we've got, we've got a pretty good mix of folks, which is fantastic. Hopefully there's something useful here for everybody. Um, let's go ahead and move to a second poll. Uh, thanks for participating in that. That moves everything well. Uh, the second one is, where are you most interested in applying more conflict skills? And uh, there can be a variety of things here, but we just kept it simple. So press a 1 for if you want to apply it at work. 2 if you want to apply it in your general community. 3 if you're wanting to apply it mostly in personal relationships. And 4 for our catch-all of other. Um, and obviously, you're welcome to apply these anywhere, but just your primary interest. So one at work, two in your community, three in personal relationships, four for other. So what we have, um, they're still coming in. The majority is uh, have pressed two, and that is so in their community. So we have 8% pressed one, 58% pressed two in my community. 4% pressed 3 in personal relationships, and 5% pressed other. Great. Um, good. So if we move ahead to the next slide, I just want to talk very briefly about the different responses to conflict that are common out there. Um, people will be most familiar with the first two, uh, probably the fight or flight response. This is a natural thing that happens. It's biological. That, uh, we tend to hit here. And then people have also often talked about a third, which is the freeze response. So there's sort of fight, flight, or freeze. And most of us fall into these sort of categories of how we tend to respond to stressors in general. Uh, and conflict, obviously, is a stressor for uh, pretty much everybody. So that's where they go in. I want to particularly uh, fight. I think people have a pretty instinctive feel for, um, though it can certainly take different forms from different people from straight out uh, knockdown fights to a more passive aggressive approach. Flight, I think uh, there's a variety of responses here that may resonate with different folks. There's just avoiding conflicts in general. There's trying to accommodate 
uh, wh whoever the conflict is with in a, in a way that is really giving in a lot of your interest, or uh, acquiesce, um, which is uh, they're all they're all of a piece and related, but all those are different forms of flight. Uh, freeze can be like a form of of avoidance or or flight, but it's it's just sort of sitting there but lost in in, in the piece as well. And then other people will talk about a specific approach to collaborate, which is you know you see a conflict and you step into it with this great intention to try to work through it. And that's sort of an idealized thing that we all try to work on. Um, but I think that's really more an intellectual uh, and spiritual maybe um, response that we learn to develop, whereas we really tend to start with fight, flight, or freeze. So move on to the next thing. We're going to uh, uh, sort of duplicate of the slide there. Don't worry about that. The next one is our, our third and final poll, which is just to find out what is your instinctive response to conflict uh, for the folks on the phone. Press 1 for fight, 2 for flight, 3 for freeze. And let's see who we're talking to. And those numbers are coming in. So let's see. So we've got um, got 18% on fight, 29, oops, 30% on flight, and 21% on freeze. Great. A nice mix across the board there as well. Good. Well, that, that's really helpful. Appreciate that from everybody. Um, so we step on now the next piece. I want to just set this in the context of sustainability here a little bit. Um, many people I'm sure are familiar with the concept of the triple bottom line uh, of sustainability being built at the intersection of social health, economic health, and environmental health or vitality and how those all fit together. And I'll just say I think the social realm of that triple bottom line is probably the least understood. It is the most squishy and the one that I think people struggle with figuring out how to actually implement. Um, it is in some ways the most complicated of them all, though they all have their complications for sure. Um, and so this is really the realm we're working in now, and I think conflict is, is one of the central pieces we want to talk about here. So if we go to the next slide, just look briefly at social sustainability. Um, I've long held that there's a variety of tools there, but to put it in terms that people are familiar with, I think a lot of it breaks down to, um, you can slice this a different way, but I'm going to focus on three primary areas. One is decision making and how decision making happens. Uh, Two is information flow and how much transparency there is around that sort of information flow and how well you can trust information. And the third is conflict resolution itself. How do you actually work on resolving conflicts? And I want to put this into a bigger context of um, maybe some historical context, right? That one of the things that has happened as the world cultures have been uh, developing democratic structures, and we know they're all not ideal, but uh, as they de develop those democratic structures, these three components all came out as ways that we're improving the process by which we could do a democracy. Um, so you know, decision making is clearly a shift from you know, monarchy to at least voting. Um, there's things around information flow. I'll skip over that for now. And conflict resolution in the, in the US system, for example, just setting up uh, a court of law, having a judicial system. And in general, there's a lot of theories. So we'll talk about the rule of law and how it's, again, imperfect, but it gives people a set series of things that they can know what to expect for how justice is worked out. And that's really a conflict resolution system. And the rule of law is a necessary component, I would say, for having a democracy in the first place. What we want to talk about is how to take that a step further. Because there are, of course, many flaws with the legal system uh, of the world. And then none of them operate at their ideal. And even if they did, they still don't resolve all conflicts successfully. Um, and there's lots of problems with that. So, um, this is really the next evolution of how you can start to do things like essentially DIY justice or DIY um, conflict work. Um, and that fits very well with, you know, sometimes people talk in the trip bottom line about the idea of equity and how that fits in. So uh, to go to the next slide, really the key piece under all of this, I think all of these social sustainability issues, and certainly around conflict resolution, is trust. And I like trust because it's a simple word. We all know it. We all understand it. Um, but it is a nuanced and deep well of something for us to pay attention to and focus in our lives and in our relationships. And so um, this is really the magic sauce of conflict work. And the problem with conflict work is that it erodes trust um, and it breaks it down. But trust is the magic ingredient for pretty much all social interaction. So if you're wanting to work in any sort of um, process outside of yourself, and some would argue within yourself, you've got to be building trust around this. Um, so it, it enables everything. It is essentially the, the fuel, I would say, for most community engagements. Um, and when it is eroded, 
it makes those things fall apart, even the simplest of social engagements. And so this is, this is the magic ingredient we want to pay attention to. The, the challenge with conflict, of course, is that it makes it fall apart. The beauty of conflict um, is that it also has the potential to build trust. And in fact, uh, for people who tend to avoid conflict, particularly, um, I think there's this idea sometimes that like, right, conflict will, will erode trust, so we should, we should avoid it. <laughs> we should avoid conflict and get away from it. Um, but the problem is that also tends to slow term erode trust also. Um, fighting also tends to erode trust, though it tends to do it much more explosively and much faster. Um, and obviously there are different cultural contexts for whether fighting or freezing or flight, uh, what sort of impact they have on the trust relationships. Uh, and I'll trust you to, to know what, what the, uh, what's the context that you're working in. But all of those effectively will erode trust, at least over the long run, if not in the short term. And so the beauty of conflict work is that if you step into it, you not only avoid that erosion, but you usually, if it's resolved successfully, will build trust much, much deeper. And that essentially gives you more power to actually make good community work happen. Um, and I've talked to a lot of community groups where they said, no, we're great because we don't have conflict. And what that typically signals to me is that you're not going that deep um, because conflict is, is inevitable. Uh, and if you're going in depth in a relationship, you're going to hit conflict. And then the question becomes how you manage or resolve or work with that conflict to transform the relationship. So um, that's why it's so important. It's not only the thing to, that you could risk losing, but it's also the great golden uh, chalice that you, you might be able to grab at the end. So just a couple other things here real quick. Um, I think it's really useful to think about the context that you're working in in a conflict. And on the next slide here, I've got a simple diagram that I've worked with sometimes, which is understanding are you working with a blank slate where there's no experience, there's no real trust, uh, positive or negative, that you're working with in this conflict? Um, and if so, there's certain things you sh you're going to need to do to try to build trust if you're going to try to resolve a conflict. Um, or are you at a level of high trust or a active distrust position. Um, and so this slide, the, the triangle over on the right, you see you know, these, there is experience here. There is a trust position of some sort, but it's either positive or negative. Um, or you're working with very little information in sort of a blank slate in the first place. Um, I'm going to, those are important for what sort of techniques you want to bring. I'm going to move to the next slide and just say here's a nice little uh, matrix that I ran across um, recently. It's adapted from a, an HR consultant named Robert Fisher uh, who sort of looked at this idea of trust and whether uh, and these different starting places that people tend to be at, and so you have uh, maybe in the lower right corner people who are uh, just believe that things are going to be bad and they remain suspicious throughout the conflict. You have folks moving over to the left who are going to probably be suspicious about what's going on until they see evidence to the contrary, until they see evidence that there's a reason to trust you or believe you. Um, moving up, you get people who will trust the situation until they see evidence uh, to the contrary that they shouldn't. And then on the far right, you have people who are going to trust no matter what, that they, they trust in this relationship. And you may find that you fit in different categories here depending on where the relationship is, uh, who the relationship is with. Um, and if we go to the next slide, I just realized like this actually juxtaposed uh, or sort of overlapped very nicely with the, um, the triangle diagram that I've worked with of understanding where you fit. But if you're with a blank slate, you're particularly likely to be in a spot of um, either trusting or suspicion uh, to start with, but that you, you're sort of waiting for more information. Whereas if you already have a belief built in uh, that you trust in the, the people you're working with or that you distrust the people you're working with, you're suspicious of them, um, that, that this starts to show how you might try to navigate over. So if you're already in a belief position of distrust, you might need to move over to establish a lot of concrete facts, observable, observable action to build that trust back up if you want to try to get over to the trust higher trust position. Um, so this is, again, all sort of theoretical. Just one last thing here I want to mention on the next slide. Uh, there's this idea you'll see in a lot of places of an emotional bank account. I think this supports very well to the idea of a trust bank account. And um, this is just a quick look at some different things that you can do to fill that bank account. Uh, and if we think of trust as the currency of dealing with conflict and dealing with social issues in general, um, it becomes really important to figure out how you build up that um, that trust pool or that uh, emotional bank account. And so there's things around taking time to empathize, hear other people, really listen to them, 
Um, attend to little details. Find out what really matters to someone and do that, whether that's the follow-up, whether that's the um, signs of caring or the dotting the T's, crossing the I's, showing up on time, different things for different people. Um, making sure you keep commitment, huge in any conflict situation, to build the integrity and build that trust. Um, clarifying expectations, it's amazing how much conflict spins out of what started as a small conflict with a miscommunication and then keeps spinning out of control. So getting very clear on that. Um, showing your own personal integrity around things and apologizing sincerely. These are all, this is not exhaustive, but these are a list of, of, of some common techniques around that. And I will just say uh, in wrapping up there that um, this idea of getting clear on what the context you're working in matters a lot. I, um, I will give you two fast examples. One is uh, working through a very difficult personal relationship that had that I was in had a lot of personal trust built up in the past. Major conflicts arose. Uh, the, that trust broke down in various ways, and um, and so it took a lot of time to rebuild that. In, in any situation where you have some past history, um, or even if you're starting in a blank slate, one of the critical things is to find where there is common ground to build on, whether that's a shared experience from the past. Um, or it is a shared value system, find that common ground, use it as a starting place because it is always a place where you have some, some sort of toehold towards that trust and built in that. But it all came back for me in this personal relationship to building on those things that we saw on that last list of uh, getting clear on the expectations, apologizing for what I'd actually done wrong. It's amazing how far that goes and how simple it is and how hard it is for people to do. Um, and and keeping commitments, attending to little details, building these things up, and um, through that, be able to navigate a lot of really great things that have now a very strong relationship. I can actually think of several things that fit in here. I'll leave it at that without going into more detail for now, just because we're at time. Um, but if we really want to look at what this looks like in practice, that's what we're going to hear a lot more about right now from Maikwe. So let me just uh, stop there and pass it over to Maikwe. Great. Thank you so much, Jacob. That was a great foundation to lay down with it. And I actually want to um, start out segueing off of something that, um, that you said a couple minutes ago. And um, you know, that is this idea that if we're not bumping into conflict, we're not actually going very deeply. And I'm going to bet that just about everybody on this call is on the call because you care about social change work and you care about cultural change work. And the reality is that we can't change those social structures without actually changing ourselves, there's a big personal growth piece where we actually have to become different people. And so the reality is we're going to make mistakes in the course of that. And that's where a lot of that conflict comes out of is we're doing very well-meaning work in the world and we're in this new territory where we're trying to create a different culture and we just don't know what we're doing because it is new territory. And so it really is inevitable that we're going to bump into conflicts with each other. And one of the things that I want folks to take away from this call is a very simple idea, and that is that embedded within every conflict is information. And that information is because there is something that is important enough to someone, whether that's you or somebody else who's involved in the conflict, it's important enough that you're upset about it getting violated in some way or not happening in some way. And sometimes that information is really deeply buried in the midst of all the dynamics that come up when we start dealing with a conflict or find ourselves in a conflict. But in some ways, our job is to uncover what that information is and to learn from it. And so the things that I want to be giving you are some uh, concrete different approaches to how we uncover that embedded information and are able to actually learn from that conflict and get out of it whatever it is that information is trying to tell us. Um, and so the first concept that I want to lay out for you is looking at discernment. And oftentimes we really shy away from discernment because we get it confused with judgment. And we all know what it feels like to be judged by somebody and we don't like it. And so we often do everything that we can to not either actually judge people or to come across as if we're judging people. And unfortunately, the, the baby that got thrown out with that bathwater in a lot of our social relationships is that we've ditched discernment along with ditching judgment. And the difference between those two things is that discernment is being able to look at a situation and say, you know what, this isn't working. 
whatever the dynamic is that is playing out right now is not actually serving me or serving some goal, and that might be a shared goal or it might just be a personal goal, but it's getting it that there's a misalignment. And that's really different than judgment, which is actually looking at a situation and trying to figure out who's to blame, looking for somebody being bad or being wrong, and fundamentally that judgment is that, that somebody is flawed in some way. And so what I want to encourage you to do is to try to move away from judgment but actually lean into discernment and lean into you know, trying to think clearly about what is actually happening. And I had a recent opportunity to do this in a conflict of my own where um, somebody invited me to sit down and uh, divide a piece of paper into two columns. And on the left side, she had me write at the top, what is my stuff? And so it was getting at, like, what are the parts that I have in this conflict that I can clearly identify as my stuff to work on? And then the other column, it wasn't what is somebody else's stuff. It was just what is not my stuff? And so it was not even trying to assign blame with what those other things were, but actually getting me to discern in a really clear way what is mine to work on, what is under my control as somebody who is a participant in this conflict, and what actually is something that I don't have any control over at all. And once I had that list, there was a huge lift for me of the anxiety and the stress around the situation because I now had the list of my stuff that I could focus on really clearly. And you deal with the stuff that's on the two sides of those columns differently. The stuff that is on the left side that's my stuff, what I'm trying to do is get clear about understanding myself and figuring out what I can change about how I'm participating in that conflict. And only after you've done that internal work are you in a position to be able to share and to actually take that step of maybe even apologizing for the ways that I fed into this conflict that have created stress not only for myself but other people. And I'll talk about apology in a minute, but I want to go to what you do with the stuff that's on the right side of that column. Um, and I know Allison's going to talk a little bit about um, reflective listening, and so I'll leave that to her, but that is part of it is like listening to actually understand what's going on with other people. And so trying to get a sense of like, what is that information? What's going on with that person that is so important to them that they're really pissed off at me about whatever this thing is? And then trying to get to a place of having as much compassion as you can for those other folks. So that's the big thing is like the combination of hearing and compassion is a really potent combination for those things. And it's not me trying to take responsibility for the stuff that's on the right side of that column that isn't really my stuff, but it's trying to relate to it in a way that gives other people the space to be able to identify what's theirs and where they feel actually supported and seen and cared for, even if I'm not actually trying to take responsibility for what those things are. So that's the first chunk that I wanted to talk about is discernment. Um, the second chunk is this sneaky little word, honesty. And this word gets used in a lot of different ways. And you, know, you can look at there's lots of different methods for personal growth and for conflict. And, um, and we often are not totally clear what we mean by this word. And so I want to break it down into actually there being two different levels of honesty that are both, both really important to engage. The first one is honesty with myself. And the second one is honesty with others. And there's a thing that happens sometimes where somebody will come into a meeting or they'll be in a conversation with them and they'll get upset and basically dump a whole bunch of stuff on you. And it can feel like a really big attack. And sometimes we do this as well. It's not only other people doing it to us. But that dumping process is actually skipping the self-honesty stage with it. So this is somebody who, you know, and often it will be um, tagged with some line along the lines of, hey, I'm just being honest. And really, that's not really a very deep version of honesty. It might be giving you the raw data about what they're upset about, but it's not actually looking at what's my part in this thing. And so the sequence to this is really important. When you're talking about honesty, that you do the self-honesty stage first and only then move on to sharing something with other people or trying to address something with other people. Um, and so that's important that you don't go directly to the giving people the raw data of your upset before you've done the self-honesty part. Now there's a flip side to this where sometimes people can get so wrapped up in self-reflection that they don't get around to actually addressing something that needs to be addressed with other people. And so you can sort of 
um, air on either side of this, but it's critical that when you look at trying to really be honest that you're working both ends of this. You're working the self-honesty end, and then you're finding a way to be compassionate and be really clear when it comes to actually being honest with other people. And that's only really possible if you've already done your own work on it. So when we're talking about my stuff, you know, the stuff that's on the left side of that column in that exercise that I was given, um, the self-reflection is a really important part. And another thing that's really important is um, actual apology. And what passes for an apology in our culture is often pretty lame. It's something along the lines of, I'm sorry that you feel bad. And that's actually not an apology. That's kind of um, condescension is really what you're communicating to somebody when you say that phrase, I'm sorry that you feel bad about something. What I'm talking about with apology is actually something that has multiple stages to it. And I'm going to lay those out, and I'll try to go slow enough that you can get these down. Um, so the first one is owning what you did or said or didn't do or didn't say that has created the upset. So the first one is owning what you did. The second one, and this is a step that often gets skipped, is recognizing the impact that your act had on the other person. That's often why an apology doesn't take, is that people don't feel like you've gotten it, that not only did you do this thing, but this is how that rippled out into my life, and this is how that affected me. So that second stage is the impact, and actually stating it in a way that the person feels seen and feels heard. That third stage is the apology. It's like what we're, what we're used to. That's the I'm sorry phase, so expressing sincere regret about what you did and apologizing. The fourth step is offering to make some kind of amends in a manner that helps to rebalance the relationship. And so this is not about punishing myself. This is about recognizing that the scales have gotten imbalanced in some way between myself and another person, and that I need to make some sincere effort to actually rebalance those things. And this is super important. There's actually been studies done on intimate relationships, and when your partner does something that you don't like, it takes five positive acts on that person's part for you to actually relax into, you know, returning to that trust place that Jacob was talking about. It's not something that just automatically happens because you've apologized for it, but you actually have to make some kind of real effort in order to get back to a place where the relationship feels really good. So that's offering to make amends. And you should check with the person and see, is this thing that I'm offering something that would actually work for you? Um, so it's not just you coming up with that in a vacuum, but there's actually a dialogue and a re-engagement that happens at this fourth stage, at the amend stage. And then the fifth stage is inviting the person's feedback. Um, so sometimes um, when you get to this phase, the person will be like, you know, it actually wasn't that big of a deal for me. Sometimes that's the response that you get. And then you know like you've been carrying a bunch of guilt around or a bunch of bad feelings around that really aren't necessary and you can lay it down. Sometimes it's, yes, and there was also this other thing that you did at the same time that actually affected me even more or there's this other piece. And so getting clear from that other person what, like how things actually look to them is a critical place. And so the last couple stages are actually more of a conversation and you know, really inviting that person to engage with you. And this is where the real trust building comes back in. Um, yeah, and there's, I do whole workshops on apologies. So I'm going to stop there, though, um, and just say that I think it's really important that you look at doing apologies in a way that are um, really positive. Um, so the stuff, that, um, the stuff that isn't on the left side of the column but is on the right side of the column, the not my parts, again, you're looking for compassion and listening to understand, and curiosity. Curiosity is a big, important thing in having your relationships last and actually feel good over the long term. Um, so the other thing I want to say is that, the, um, and I know Allison's going to get into talking a little bit about culture with this, that um, there's ways that you can, when you're part of a group, actually set up an environment that is going to help you normalize dealing with tensions. Because right now our um, what's normalized in our culture for dealing with tensions tend to be things like blame and gossip um, and trying to figure out who's wrong and that kind of stuff. And so I want to invite the possibility that we can actually set things up in such a way that we normalize dealing with things well. And so one of the things 
to do for um, in order to do that is actually have regular check-ins with each other. And so um, at Dancing Rabbit Eco Village, where I currently live, um, we start a lot of our meetings out with doing check-ins with each other and actually staying connected with each other. And that's an opportunity too, where if something's not working for somebody, they're able to name it, and you can actually go, oh. Great, now I have that information about what's not working for that person that I can put into play uh, and really help us um, stay in good relation to each other. And it doesn't even have to be addressed as a conflict. It's one of the many ways that you can deal with things when they're small. And so that's my second piece of advice in terms of creating a culture that works is don't wait until you're so angry you're ready to explode. Like the first time that something feels off, and it could even just be a little intuitive wiggle that you get of like, ooh, something doesn't quite feel right with that person, um, inquiring, getting curious, trying to figure out what it is that's actually not working, and addressing things when they're just little tiny bumps instead of waiting until you have this whole huge mountain to have to climb with each other. And if you're able to do that, then that also gives you an opportunity to practice your listening skills and your apology skills and whatnot when things are really not that big of a deal. And if you're able to do that, then that sets you up for actually when you really need those skills, when that big thing is up, that you're able to actually have some confidence under your belt that, oh, I've bumped into little things with this person before. I think we can get through this because we've laid that foundation over time. Okay, I'm going to stop there and uh, pass the baton to Allison. Okay, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, loud and clear. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks, Caroline. Thanks, Caroline. I want to express some gratitude for the opportunity to participate in this conversation. It's super fun. And to all the people that are listening, really glad to have you here and really impressed with you. You know, it sounds like what, 58% of you really want to work on conflict in your community, even though most of you feel like fleeing <laughs> um, when you face conflict. So I really appreciate that you're here and you're studying and thinking about this with us. Um, it's, a, it's an important topic um, for, for all of us. I know that for me, this is something that I engage with in my family, with my daughter, with my partner, with my local community, um, with the wider community. And you know, obviously internationally we hear all kinds of horror stories about how, um, how domination and oppression and war um, result in, in violence when they, when they really don't, don't have to. Um, I mean, not that <laughs> – I think I didn't say that the way I meant to. I think you get the idea. So I'm following up on Jacob's wonderful laying of the groundwork here about trust and Maikwe's work on um, – Having our having our self awareness and our ability to to relate with each other from that place to talk specifically about some um, means of having conflict that are um, that can be creative and restorative and transformative. Um, and I want to point you actually to something that TransitionNetwork.org um, says about dealing with conflict. I just noticed this as I was preparing for this conversation. Um, there is a there is a little article on dealing with conflict on transitionnetwork.org where they say, um, we're convinced it's possible to take advantage of conflicting positions and use them to generate energy rather than soak it up. And when we find a group that's figured out how to make that happen, we'll let everyone know. <laughs> and so I told Caroline, it seems like you're doing what you said. Your transition is letting everyone know, hey, some folks from FIC who have been living in community and working on this for you know, 20, 30 years have figured some things out. So, um, so I'm happy to be here as, as part of the team bringing this to, to you all and to the, restore, um, to the, um, the transition network. Um, sounds like we struck a chord with so many registrants. And um, I want to say first off that um, there are things that you can do in your community or your family, your workplace, <clears throat> to, to set in place creative and restorative means of having conflict so that you're not taken aback when it occurs. And, you know, as Jacob and Maigwe both said, conflict is going to happen. You know, I've heard it said, if you don't have conflict, then you're not a group. <clears throat> then you're not a group. And so if you, if you are in a group, then you have an opportunity to work with the people in your group and create your own culture within that group. Um, you can set in place some practices, like Maikwe was saying, check-ins, 
clearings of minor issues, sharing things you're withholding about each other in order to build connection, sharing fears and dreams, um, in order to build a culture of respect and connection and trust and justice with each other. Um, and really, we are talking about justice here, as Jacob said. We're, we're interrupting patterns of oppression and interrupting the enacting of unearned privilege when we work on conflict in this creative way. Um, I, I, I study with Dominic Barter for, for about six years. I've been studying restorative circles from him and, and other mentors, and he says respect means to look again. Um, so, so when we respect someone, we see our first glance of who we are, who we think they are. And then if we respect them, really we are looking again at their deeper humanity, their essence, and um, learning, to, learning to see through, through new eyes. And I think um, really this work is about social justice. So if you can set these kinds of things in place, it will reduce the chance that conflict actually becomes painful. You know, conflict essentially is not necessarily something that is violent. It's not necessarily going to cause harm. It actually can reduce harm and rebuild connection itself. Jacob pointed out how important it is to, um, to build trust by, by taking actions that um, reinforce our, our commitment with each other. Well, having conflict creatively can actually give a huge positive experience to build up trust with someone. Um, and so, so that's, that's sort of the, the heading of all of these, um, these restorative practices is that you are trying to build connection and trust through having conflict together. Um, and so ideally your group will set up some kind of practices in advance so that they are ready when conflict arises. Just like when you, <clears throat> if you are hungry and you haven't built a kitchen yet, um, you know, I live out here on a homestead where there was just raw land when we moved here. We didn't have a place to, to cook or eat or go to the bathroom and had to build it up from scratch. And when we were hungry, there was a lot to do <laughs> to make it so that we could eat food. And now that we have a kitchen, we actually don't have to take that much time to, um, to prepare the space. It's already there. We, we thought in advance, at some point we're going to get hungry, and we made a kitchen so that when we wanted to make some food, we could go into that place and make food there comfortably. It had a sink. You know, it had the things that we needed. So just the same way, you want to set up your conflict kitchen. You want to have a practice or practices that are ready for you to pick them up and use them when conflict inevitably arises. Um, and ideally, they're grounded in your group's culture. So they arise out of your community. They're not imposed from outside or pressed from a cookie cutter. They're practices that, um, that go along with your, your group culture. I worked with a group in Vermont called um, Camp Destiny, and um, they learned about restorative circles from, from me and from Dominic Barter <clears throat> and others, and they decided to call it heart mirroring because that was in line with the language that they use. So find something that is really um, speaks to the essence of your group. And you want, it to, um, to, 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 you want to find a way to support members of your community to carry it out themselves, not rely on outside experts that you have to hire. You really want it to be something you can just pick up and use when it occurs and not have to wait until you have enough money to bring someone from somewhere to do something for you. So it's really the DIY approach here that is going to be the most empowering for you um, and the most transformative. And so when you're setting it up, you want to make sure that you take care of, um, of five elements that are really crucial for it to go well. Um, you want to make sure that you at least have buy-in, if not active participation, from all the players, whether it's your, your partner and your child if you're working in your family, or it's all your whole staff if you're in a workplace, or it's you know, most of the key sources of power in your community. Um, you want to make sure that everyone says, yes, we're going to try this, this tool, this method, this practice. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not also, you know, in my community, we still, you know, send inflammatory, passive aggressive emails and yell at each other in meetings. It's not like this is the only thing that we do, but we do have um, a conflict approach that we have written down and decided to, to follow when things arise. So you don't have to be perfect with this uh, or use it 100% of the time, but at least if you have buy-in that everyone is like, yes, we're going to try this and see how it goes. That's really helpful. Um, the second thing is you want to have the means of offering inspiration and support for people who are going to host or facilitate your chosen practice or practices. 
you need those people. Maybe they want training. Maybe they just want to, you know, get some, some co-counseling from someone before they host a session. You know, whatever they need for support and inspiration, um, you want to make sure you give those hosts or facilitators your support. Um, the third is you need a space, some kind of shared space that's accessible, that's neutral, or even that, um, that symbolizes uh, creative conflict transformation or peace in your community. This is your literal conflict kitchen, the place that you're going to go to and sit down and, and have a dialogue. Um, the fourth thing is you need a way of initiating this practice that's accessible to everyone. So if there are kids in your culture, in your system, you need it to be something that they can access, um, a bell they can ring or something like that. Or a, you know, they have to put their name in a certain folder on the wall or something if they want someone to um, help them you know, initiate your circle or your process some means of starting a circle that, that doesn't have a gatekeeper. It's not like you request a circle or ask someone for a circle. It needs to be something that anyone can initiate and there's no questions asked. The ball just starts rolling. That's very helpful and um, helps to level the playing field and right away reduce some um, layers of, of privilege that some of us have over others. And finally, you need a way of keeping your community members informed, including new folks, um, about how the process works and how to initiate the, the practice. Um, so if you have those five elements, the buy-in, support for the people, the hosts and facilitators, the space, a way of initiating the practice or launching that, getting that ball rolling that's accessible, and a way of keeping people informed, those are the basic elements that once you take care of those, then, um, then you can build a restorative practice in your community that is likely to, to be functional for you and creative. And so let's see, Caroline, how much time do I have left? I have about five minutes or so. Well, we're, we're a little, um, spending a little more time on the presentations and want to give ample time for Q&A. So I think mm -hmm. wrapping up in the next few minutes would be great. Great. Well, um, what to do when conflict becomes painful? Um, some information, as Maikwe put it, is not getting heard. There's some feedback about what needs aren't getting met in your system or your culture or your community. And conflict is this source of energy that people generate when they sense a threat or experience harm to something they care about. It's this, it's this red and gold force field that protects what we care about and urges us to let others know how much we care. Um, and so when we feel that arise in us, we know what it feels like, that's the system needing to update itself and give feedback about these needs that aren't getting met and this pain that's arising from that. And so just recognizing that, that conflict is okay, it's really important actually because it helps us take care of these things, can really help as a basic foundational place to come from when we're approaching conflict. Um, so, so that's kind of step zero, you know, just connect with that purpose that conflict can have for us. And you want to listen to others, breathe, connect with your basic humanity and others' basic humanity, um, and then begin reaching out to your community and get support to engage with the people involved. Um, Dominic Barter says, walk toward the conflict. He's one of the originators of restorative circles, and he says, when we move away and when we engage the justice system, you know, the overarching criminal justice system, then that causes the pain that's not being expressed to get louder and more violent and, um, and actually results in more repression and more fear and more, um, more anger and um, more pain. So if we walk slowly toward the conflict, we don't need to rush toward it headlong, but if we can walk into it, that actually is a safer place to be because then we can actually hear each other without having to shout. Um, we can have a dialogue. So dialogue is the heart of addressing conflict creatively. Dominic says, dialogue is a conversation between equals whose end is unknown, if I remember correctly. Um, and so when we're getting into that dialogue, we're undoubtedly going to fear a lot, feel a lot of emotions, including fear. <laughs> And um, fear in my belly feels like a rock. And I like in these situations to remember that I can be like water. I can move around the rock instead of saying, I need to smash you. I can just move around it. I can flow. And um, Mike, I mentioned curiosity. Curiosity for me is the key 
to, it's like a thing I can ride on the water around the rock. Um, so I ride my curiosity to flow like water around that rock of fear. And, um, and my curiosity is, is, is like, where are the places where people's needs are not met in this system? I'm an activist. I am a political activist. I'm a social justice activist um, my whole life. And so I'm really energized by this, this attitude of like, I am, I am here to find places where I can um, improve people's lives, improve our, um, our joy in being awake on this earth with each other. And so when I find conflict, I see, oh, here's a place where people's needs are not being met. I can do something here. I can, I can make a difference. And so ride that curiosity to flow around your fear and find a place where you can listen to be changed. And that's key is listen to be changed. Um, often we're listening to find the hole in the other people's argument or we're listening um, because we need to figure out how to defend ourselves from their attack. Um, if we're listening with an attitude of like, I can be transformed by this moment, then the whole conversation is going to be different. We're going to be able to slow down and hear each other. And so the reason that it's helpful sometimes to have a host of these conversations or a mediator or a facilitator is because when we get angry and we get in pain, we often want to rush and hurry and shout and over, over speak each other um, and interrupt. And, um, when we can slow down that conversation and reflect the meaning that we hear the other person saying, then we can build up understanding rather than eroding it. Jacob said sometimes conflict tears down trust. Well, it tears down trust sometimes when we let it rush down the gully like a, you know, like a flood. It erodes literally the soil of our understanding and our trust. But if we slow down the flow, you know, in permaculture, there's all these ways to slow the flow of water across the landscape. If we slow down the conversation by saying, okay, well, hang on, let me check and make sure I understand what's really important to you here. Here's what I heard. Is that right? Then we're causing that erosion to slow down and maybe even building up um, understanding what's the metaphor. Like, like in an alluvial plain, you know, we're building up the soil in the place where the, the floodwaters settle because um, we're looking at what that important meaning is. Where is the aliveness? Where is the thing that that person really is caring about and protecting? Um, and from that moment, we begin to flow down from feelings and positions, which is where we often start, down till we're seeking the underlying interests, the values, and the needs that are beneath that person's feelings and positions. And when you get there, you want to take time to see and treasure those universal human needs because that's what we're all here about. That's, that's where we live. And when we can get to that part of the conversation, don't rush through it. People might be choking up or getting really moved. Don't rush through that and try to gloss over it. Stay there a minute. That's going to really be a place where you can build big connection um, for finding actions that do address the needs of all concerned. And that's where you want to go next once you've dwelt for a while in those universal human needs. You want to find actions that you can commit to that will do a better job than you've been doing within your culture of addressing the needs of all the people concerned. And I really believe that um, involving the community surrounding the conflict is, is critical to find actions that are really powerful because so often conflict arises out of an oppressive system that we're part of and we can't really see it because we're in it. And if people are there who have helped to support the conflict arising, they can be a partner with you in tearing down those barriers and those systems of oppression. Um, I'll, I'll offer as a final minute a story of something that happened this morning with my eight-year-old daughter. She, um, I was having an argument with her about how to pronounce the nickname of a character in a book she was reading. Um, maybe you are a parent and can understand. <laughs> um, I wanted her to understand the spelling rules behind it and why it was pronounced in a certain way, and she wanted to pronounce it the way she wanted to pronounce it. Um, and we kind of got into a stalemate about it, and in the end, uh, I kind of tried to see where she was coming from and reflected that back to her. Didn't work. She was still shut down, wouldn't make eye contact. I tried to express what I was trying to do, you know, protect her from ridicule if she read it to some other kid or um, you know, teach her as a parent how to, how to use English properly. Didn't work. She was still shut down. Um, and, and 
finally I just let there be a pause and I said, well, I don't know what to do. <laughs> I'm really trying to help and I'm not doing a very good job. And I think, I think somehow I'm getting in the way. So I'll just try to get out of the way now. <laughs> and she said, I'm going to ask Trish, who's another, um, another home, home school teacher who is actually teaching her language arts right now. And I said, why Trish? I studied English in college. I know, the, I know how to pronounce English. And she said, Mama, you are denying me and what I want to do. And I was like, whoa. She feels like I'm... I'm, I'm denying her as a person. I'm denying her choices. I'm denying her very realistic, reasonable decision of where to seek information. And I was just, I was just shattered in that moment. I was actually, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut. I kind of doubled over where I was sitting and started to weep and was like, oh, cool. I did not mean to do that. You're totally right. I know exactly how that feels. I'm so sorry. And she could see that I really meant it. She could see I had let it in and let it change me. And five minutes, probably ten minutes later in the car, I was singing a song, and she said, that's not how it goes, Mama. <laughs> and, and then she caught herself, and she said, actually, I was denying you just then, and I don't mean to do that. But it does go a little differently from how you were singing it. <laughs> and I just wanted to share that because it, you know, the transitionnetwork.org site said, you know, when we find a group that's figured out how to make that happen, you know, gen generate energy by having conflict, they let you know. And actually, you may be doing it all of the time. You may be finding ways that in your little conflicts and in ways that you listen to each other through them, you might, be, you might discover that you actually are using conflict to build connection and trust already, and you just haven't been giving yourself credit. So look for those moments and celebrate them. And I'll, I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you, Allison and Jacob and um, Maya Quay, too. And just wanted to see if um, Jacob and Maya Quay and Allison as well, if you wanted to mention something quickly before we open it up for questions that the others of you um, brought up. So why don't you um, just dive in if you have a few more comments, and then we'll open up for questions pretty soon. Sure. I, I wrote down this phrase as Allison was talking, which is, conflict is a system recalibrating. And like, it's, it's interesting to me to look at like, how each one of the things that we were talking about is sort of a variation on the theme of like something is shifting, and it's almost like we're um, we're sort of trying to catch up with ourselves and we bump into each other in these really uncomfortable ways when we're in that kind of system change. And it shows up in this really personal kind of way of like a conflict between me and this one other person. And yet one of the things that I'm hearing is that I think what's actually happening is that a system is shifting and that we're participating in it in some way. And it's not going smoothly. And so to me, that makes it possible like as a social change advocate to actually celebrate this process a little bit more and not take it so personally, but really see this as like, oh yeah, we're all just in this like massive project of cultural reinvention right now. And boy, it's uncomfortable some days, isn't it? And sometimes it personalizes in the form of a conflict. So that was the thing I was thinking about as Allison was talking. Thank you. Right, Maikwe. It's, it's, um, Dominic Barter says that we're, we're renovating our relationships through the medium of pain. <laughs> so there are other ways to renovate our relationships, and, and I think we all encourage mm -hmm. the listeners to, to take advantage of those too and have some shared enjoyable right. activities. Um, but when pain does arise, to celebrate that in a way and say, okay, now we get a chance to, to get closer somehow through this experience. Mm -hmm. And when yeah, you say Go, oh, ahead, go ahead, Jacob, and then we'll open it up for questions, I think, because it's uh, after the say, hour. Sure. Yeah, I just want to say I, I, I really appreciate all the wisdom I think flying around in this. Uh, listening to you both is great and a lot of good things. And I think I just want to name for folks doing broader sort of community scale work here that a lot of this sounds so sort of framed in the personal. Um, and I think there's two things to note there. One is that that's because it always is. <laughs> no matter what kind of conflict you're talking about, whether it's on a national scale or not, it's still personal. Um, and two, to recognize that um, these, this idea of using this, the, the, what you have in front of you to practice for the next big 
conflict, the next big fight, whatever it might be, um, really ports over in this way, and that uh, I just invite people to to use that as a as a practice ground wherever you can. Thank you. Let's um, open it up for for questions, and want people to be brief if possible. Um, press one on your keypad, and we'll get through to as many of you as we can. So we'll start with um, Carrie. Uh, Hi, Carrie. can you hear me? Yes, yes. we do. So uh, I think the parenting ground is probably a pretty rich mm -hmm. one. And it made me think about the uh, that I would like to hear what all three of you have to say about the courage to begin the process when, you know, this person is my son, he's probably going to be around forever, and I could just let this go, but, and, like, it took a lot of courage yesterday for me to tell my 27-year-old son that you should not put potato salad in the microwave because it has raw egg in the mayonnaise. It, apparently, he didn't know it, and he was not very happy with that information. But I said to myself, and I told my husband later, I said, if I'm afraid of him getting mad at me for correcting him, then I'm not a good mother and I need to be courageous and tell him stuff he doesn't want to hear. Because when you well, know people that well, you're a good you mother. know what they don't want to hear. <laughs> Thank first you. First of all, you're a good mother because you're thinking about it and you're working on it. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you deeply. Um, I guess... I guess I can just say first that I think that when we are in a relationship of having a young person who we ha who, who's deeply dependent on us for so many things, who, with whom we have this amazing role of 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 mentor, teacher, caregiver, um, c you know, collaborator, um, there is so much that we can learn from them uh, and from ourselves when we can see clearly what is going on and what those roles are. I know sometimes I feel like I, I have this responsibility to teach her, to show her what's right, but actually today the lesson came when I stepped out of the way and let her take charge. And, um, and so I think that, that the tightrope that we walk is encouraging them to become their own person while um, also keeping them from you know, playing with knives in the middle of the street. <laughs> you know, there's 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 things that we need to provide them information about in order to keep them safe in the world. At the same time, recognize their inherent wisdom, and that is a really that is a really hard line to walk. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that gets I'll your, just one other, your question. I just have one other quick thing on that, which is I think it's uh, it, it's good to look at not avoiding the conflict. That's great. Um, it's also I think really useful to remember to try to check. Um, with other people, when is the right time to bring the conflict up? Whether it's just asking, like, hey, can I, can I suggest something right now or ask about something? I think this is true in personal relationships. I see it with my own kids a lot. I also think it's true when dealing with elected officials or other things like that to find out when is the best time for them to bring up the conflict. And it often helps. That simple step often gets a much more uh, fruitful response. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Let's I would say the, to the balance uh, point that the balance point that I do is like, is it more important in this moment for me to be right or for me to be in relationship with this person? And there's not always an obvious answer to that. Like if you genuinely believe he's about to poison himself, by all means bring it up. And I think there's a lot of times though where we get sort of hooked on this wanting to be right or wanting to correct someone's behavior or whatever when actually the most important thing is to be in a good relationship with that person. And so that's the the um, question that I ask myself in those situations. Great. Let's take another question from Luana. Yeah, hi. Thank you for this. Um, I find myself working on um, in uh, community groups and adv advocacy groups with people who do not share my worldview or my core values, but do have uh, uh, tremendous assets and talents and benefits to our shared goal. Um, it's it's often uh, you know they're a source of conflict um, in our groups as to tactics and uh, who's really at fault for the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, so how should we approach it? Um, so I'm not really sure how to deal with that when I end up 
uh, being the radical nut over in the corner um, and get dogpiled and scapegoated uh, when we're all actually working on the same goal at one particular this moment or the, the next. Um, and I find it gets in the way of actually trying to create an alternative to our current system. And it, uh, we wind up just going along with things instead of really doing meaningful change. Now let's hear from, how about we just hear from um, one of you. Uh, <laughs> I would love to hear Jacob's response to that as he's done okay. a lot of community organizing stuff. Yeah. Go ahead, Jacob. Just, just when I was going to try to defer to you. All right, uh, so um, <laughs> I, think, <laughs> I think this issue of common ground is big. I think it's, it's important to both clarify where is there common ground, and sometimes it's really useful to get very explicit about where there is not common ground so everyone knows where that stands, but also so that everyone can set it aside because it's probably not going to be the most fruitful place to work. Um, and you know, it depends on the situation. Sometimes you have to dive into that because that is the root issue. Um, but if you can find the place where you are focusing the work to go together um, and, and building on that common ground, I think that's, that's where I've seen a lot of people do really good work of bringing very diverse groups together. Uh, to get something done is when they've been able to say, yep, we disagree on X, Y, and Z, but we all agree on B. And so we are going to figure out how to move B forward in a way that does not trigger our disagreements on X, Y, and Z. Um, and it's, it's just partly a question of the context you're working in. That's my quick thought. Great. Thank you. Um, Wendy Taylor, go ahead. Hi there. Um, Mike, I just wanted to comment. I think it was Allison saying that story, that beautiful story with your child, and the one of the end results was about you feeling, you know, vulnerable enough to just kind of curl up and cry a little, you know, in that moment. And I think that, I just want to say that helps normalize the, the discussion on conflict when a teacher expresses that level of truth. So it was just helpful, and I had tears in my eyes. <laughs> but um, the questions are, in a group process, what is the level of, because that I think there's this catharsis and growth that happens when people get to that emotional point of, wow, I really see this now. But what is appropriate on a group process that perhaps people can't just you know, start crying or whatever when they're in conflict is my, my first question. And my second question is, my own expectation that I have lived with that I'm trying to look at, which is that it really helps when people apologize. Why can't they just apologize? <laughs> <laughs> How about Mike? I'll take the first part. You take the second? Um, sure. Uh, so thanks. I'm glad my story was moving for you. I think that what, I, what it sounds like is in your group culture, it's not okay to express emotion in the form of tears. And I might be making an incorrect assumption, but that is true of many groups. And I would examine that a little bit and see if it's serving you. It may be that if you gain skills with um, being okay to sit with that kind of emotion being expressed in group, that it might become okay and might actually transform those conversations in a way that, that you didn't expect because of the vulnerability that, you, that you're wisely noting that, that's shown there. And so if you can find a way of you know, welcoming all different kinds of emotions, all ways of talking in meetings um, as lo with a skilled facilitator who knows how to hold that without allowing more harm to take place, who can sit with that person and not allow attacks and aggression, but just allow the expression of emotion, um, then it can really take you places. So I would, I would explore that. And, um, and I know that Maikwe and I are, are giving trainings on exactly that kind of thing. So we can talk more about that if you're interested at the very end. Yeah, and so the apology dynamic. And, you know, it's hard. I, I know that feeling so well of, like, really wanting somebody to just own something and apologize. And what I found is that that's, that can be a really self-defeating urge because you can't actually make them do it. And so... And that's painful. And the other thing that I've learned as I've, you know, sometimes been willing to get more vulnerable with somebody that I wish would apologize is that I discover that they think they already have often. And 
part of why I'm starting to actually break down what real apologies are in the teaching work that I'm doing is that I think there's a lot of misunderstandings about what a sincere apology that really rings true and that opens the door for deeper connection actually looks like, and that most of us have no idea how to actually do that. But I've been shocked the number of times when I've gotten into it and in frustration gone, I wish you would just apologize. And they're like, what do you mean? I did that six months ago. It's like, wait a second. <laughs> we are missing each other. And so I think like being open to the idea that like this is about skill set and a lot of people just don't have it, and to cut each other a little bit of slack around that I think can be really helpful. And sometimes just ask. You know, there's this thing that was really hard. I'm deeply longing for an apology. Where do you think we're at in processing through that thing and opening up to the possibility that they might think they've already done it? So that's, that's my best 30-second advice on that one. And we'll hear from uh, Rob in Portland. Then we'll do a formal close, and um, the presenters can stay around another five minutes or so to answer a few additional questions. So Robin Portland, go ahead. Very good. Thank you. I wanted to ask Mike, well, you mentioned earlier something about self-honesty. Um, and I wanted to know if you could explain a little bit more about how to do the self-honesty part before being honest with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and again, I think it's critical that you do it in that order. And I think that this looks a lot of different ways to a lot of people. For me, the technique that I find most helpful, because I'm a writer, is actually writing through something, like starting with something like super ranty, like if I was going to dump on people, this is what I would dump, and then letting myself get that out of my system, and then being able to take a step back and go, all right, and what's my part of it? And just sitting with it and giving myself quiet space and time to be able to actually sort of write through that process and get clear about it. Some people do it through meditation. Some people do it through journaling. Some people do it through asking a trusted friend to give them feedback on what they are seeing in the situation. So there's a lot of different ways to do it, but I think it almost always involves slowing down and getting quiet and opening yourself up to you know, some degree of vulnerability and the possibility that I do have something to do with this situation that's being really hard for me. And so there's a lot of techniques out there, it's, and I don't really care what technique people use, but I think the, the criticality is actually pausing before you launch into what everybody else is doing wrong, where you, where you go, okay, what, what did I do that is feeding into this situation? And that's the critical thing in whatever way you know, your learning style and orientation um, points you to doing it. Like, I don't really care what it looks like, but, that, but it almost always involves getting slow and getting self-reflective. Thank you so much. And let's hear some closing comments. And again, for those of you still with your hands up, we'll try to get to you after the closing comments, but I did want to let people off the call who need to. Um, so Jacob, can we start with you and go in the same order? Sure. Um, I think the, the thing I just want to end with here is to recognize that this is hard work. <laughs> and the context that you're working is really different in each case. And so this idea of slowing down and listening um, that Allison brought up, this idea of cultivating curiosity that Mike Clay brought up, I think these are really critical, um, not just as a skill you can practice, but because they will unlock whatever the truth is for that situation. And there is not a magic um, bullet that will, that will solve every situation. And so those, those are really the tools that help figure out what's the right solution there. And, and thanks again to everybody for joining today and for, for all my co-panelists here. It's really a pleasure. All right, thank you. Yeah, the word that I want to focus on is culture, because I think that our wider culture has done a really horrible job of teaching us how to be in our emotions, how to do things like conflict resolution, and that what we're having to do is basically a whole bunch of unlearning culture and then relearning and kind of having to rediscover and find our way through what that new culture looks like. And so that's where a lot of my teaching and public speaking work has gone in the last few years has been you know, really emphasizing what a healthy, balanced, cooperative culture looks like. And 
um, you know, I would love, this is such a quick little snippet that we're able to do on a call like this, and so I invite people, if you're interested in exploring culture more, to definitely get in touch with me. I'm, it's kind of my favorite topic at the moment, and I'm going to be doing a lot of teaching work in the mountain states over the next um, year or so on this topic, and um, I'm also happy to travel different places. So please dialogue and recognize that if this is really hard, it's because you're unlearning a lifetime of stuff in order to be able to do it. Thank you. And um, just wanted to remind all of you, too, to um, pass on some resources to us, which we can also post on our website. So Allison, your closing thoughts? Sure. Um, I think I want to close with the thought that when conflict arises out of some pain of, that hasn't been heard and healed, that often um, if that pain is not heard after it, it comes up, then it gets louder and louder and louder and can be violent and can result in endless violent um, reprisals. And when that happens, um, probably something, someone or something in the system is resistant to change and is invested in the status quo. Because when someone or something is in, invested in the status quo and resisting a change there, then any feedback coming from someone in the system about, hey, this is painful, my needs aren't getting met, um, might reduce the, the, the structural power of the people who are invested in the system. And so that's kind of a, a more political way of looking at it, but actually that flitted through my mind this morning with my daughter. Oh, I have a lot of structural power over her. Maybe I'm invested in things staying the way they are here. Where, where might I be more open to change here than I am? So just invite you to, to look at um, those patterns that might be in place that, um, that, some, that, that you may be playing into um, and, and try to interrupt those if you can inside yourselves and in the system that you find yourself a part of. And um, Again, I, wanted... I have my, my email where you can reach me is um, ACE Facilitation, A-C-E, that's my initials actually, facilitation at gmail.com. And I'll have a website, acefacilitation.org, live pretty soon. And I'm teaching a facilitation training focusing on conflict June 2nd to 5th in New England, in uh, New Hampshire, actually. Um, we've closed registration, but if you get in touch with me and say you were on the call today, um, we'll slip you in. <laughs> um, I also have some resources if you want to stay on the call. I want to list those later, but I don't want to take longer right now. Great. Thank you. Um, so I wanted just to thank you, you three, for being with us. I know you have decades of experience, and it's very helpful, and I know we just scratched the surface. And for those of you who can stay for another, I think we'll only have time for two more questions. Um, so Jeffrey Billings, go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. I can. Yep. Okay, great. Um, well, I really enjoyed the talk, and um, I'm especially curious about the um, the system that you're um, suggesting that we put in place in our communities, sort of have these elements kind of ready at hand when uh, when they're needed. And I'm wondering if you can give us um, some details on what types of elements or practices, procedures, techniques that you would recommend we sort of have ready to go, receive training in ahead of time? Sure. Um, well, uh, a couple of basic things that I would recommend are practicing nonviolent communication. So um, Marshall Rosenberg has, has written some great work on that. There are websites too. Um, CNBC is the website to go to for all that stuff. That's I statements, reflective listening, um, getting and giving empathy. Reflective listening being, what did you hear the other person say? What's the golden nugget of meaning that you heard behind what they were saying and expressing? Um, uh, practices like where you are sharing withholds, things that you've been withholding from each other. Um, my family does a goods and griefs session at our weekly meetings um, where we share things that we've appreciated over the past week and we share things that have not gone well for us over the past week. Just as a matter of, of course, we've introduced that and welcomed it into our our family meetings. Um, those are some sort of ways to reduce the chances that painful conflict will arise. Um, I really have become um, 
really convinced that restorative circles are a super powerful way of working with conflict in our groups and communities. Um, and you can find out more um, at restorativecircles.org um, or by you know, searching the Internet for stuff. There isn't a book about that yet that I know of. Um, but it's similar to restorative justice, you know, a movement that's been around since the 90s, um, in that it, um, restorative circles provide time and time for people to connect with, um, with what's important to them, what's at stake with them, and get heard around that by the people, like directly by the people that they are in conflict with. So um, there's, there's t ways that you can get trained to facilitate and host these circles. Um, it's a whole workshop in itself, um, you know, a week-long workshop, <laughs> really. Um, but I do recommend looking, looking up uh, restorativecircles.org. Um, also, IC.org, the FIC's website, has a bookstore with a lot of books on conflict that, um, that you might be interested in. And Restorative Circles and Dominic Barter actually are covered on the transitionnetwork.org website. Um, there's an article called A Healthy Culture of Conflict from the Favelas of Brazil that I recommend having a look at. Um, there's also a booklet called Working with Conflict in Our Groups that's free on the Internet from um, Seeds for Change, which is a UK organization. And there's resources listed at the end of that as well. So dialogue with the person informally, formally, mediation, dialogue with the support of a full community circle or a restorative circle. Those are sort of the practices I would recommend to restore and connection the, the, and repair harm. And the final question goes to Libby Baker. Go ahead, Libby. I'm not sure you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Yep. Okay. I'm afraid my question is maybe too much to answer in the time we have left, but um, I've had experiences where um, some people really have manipulative patterns, and it's very difficult to deal with and tends to undermine. And I can own my own stuff all I want, but if, it's, a, mm. it's as if these things don't work unless there is the assumption that everyone, I think you said buy in, but buy in, some people can't. And it's very hard to deal with that. Mm hmm yeah, Libby, I think that the I think that that's absolutely true that there are that there are people who are more or less bought into that stuff. And so I think as a group, it's really important to get clear about what are our expectations of each other, what are our agreements with each other about communication and whatnot, and then to be bold enough to address them when somebody appears to not be following those agreements. I think that an, you know every organization should have some basic ground rules for, how you interact with each other. And it's different if you're collaborating across organizations. That's a different setup. But if you have a system that you're an internal system that you're part of, I think being really clear about what are our expectations of each other and what's going to happen if somebody breaks those can create a field where it's possible to address those kinds of things. Um, and, and I have great sympathy for what you're saying. I think that those, that those dynamics definitely do come up, and yet we're often passive in trying to set up a system that can interrupt those things, and I think that's really important to be able to do that. Well, My guess is that that person who seems to be being manipulative might not be getting their needs met. So you could explore with them you know, privately or with a few trusted friends, you know, what is it that you really need and care about here? What's at stake for you? And really explore that deeply. Give them a chance to be really deeply heard. And while holding your own boundaries very firmly about not allowing yourself to be manipulated, while allowing yourself to be changed and moved by what they have to say, which is a tricky dance, but it can be a pretty fun dance. 